get up here to be able to do this work. It's a blessing. It's a tremendous blessing, unlike any that I can express and explain. And so we're going to go ahead and get here into the gospel this evening. And this particular topic that is on my heart here, um, as I was going through the sermons that I've had prepared, uh, that I can modify, this one kept coming back up over and over and over and over again in my mind. So I believe this is what God has for us this evening. And so if you have your Bibles here, please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17 tonight, and we're going to be talking here about the cost of freedom, your freedom here this evening. General George Patton was a great warrior with a terrifyingly good set of instincts for battle. He was, un, he was known for his hot temper, his distaste for people that he deemed cowardice. He was known for being very aggressive, and he was also known for never refusing to, for he, he just refused. He refused to accept defeat, no matter where it came from. And he led with this temper, with this idea, this mindset, the Third Army of the United States uh, military during World War II. And he garnered the respect of both the Russians and the Germans due to his ferocity in battle and the way he carried himself as a leader, including the cruel ways that he would deal with his men that he deemed to be cowards, including his most infamous story of running into the medical tents, finding anybody in there who was there trying to feign an illness, dragging them out and beating them to a pulp. Ruthless, merciless man. Many believed that he was only built for war and anything else would be difficult for him to be successful at. Patton was often brought down to his knees, however, asking God for guidance in his war proceedings. And he was even humbled by the way God could turn the tides in a battlefield. One infamous prayer that I remember reading from him, and I'm going to paraphrase this for you. A snowstorm had hit, and this was the final battle he had where he destroyed the Panzer di uh, Division. The Panzer Tank Division was the most powerful division of the Nazi German military. It was the most feared, most destructive division of their armed forces. And in this day... Patton would receive his greatest military victory. But it came three days late because of a giant snowstorm that had hit. And Patton was on his knees begging, God, God, please, I want this done. You know I needed this to be a clear day. What are you doing? Why would you let the snow come down? And in that time, he didn't realize that the Panzer Division got stuck in the mud that was created by the snow. It froze General Patton gains an overwhelming victory, and then he looks at it, he drops to his knees, turns his eyes to heaven, then bows his face completely down and says, God, you are the greatest military strategist that there ever was and that there ever will be. I stand humbled before your infinite wisdom. Thank you for the victory this day. General Patton embodied the fighting spirit in a way that many of us could only dream of ever seeing it. And he understood that freedom always came at a cost. It was never free. And he understood that men must work and fight against the enemies for of fear, doubt, laziness, and whatever else may come against us. He understood that a cost would be paid when the mantle of action would be assumed so that we could have victory. And he understood that we must face our enemy ready for a fight. So let me ask you, what has you captivated in fear right now? And how can we apply General Patton to this? So starting in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8, the word of the Lord says, And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, this being Goliath, and he said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in a battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. 
If he is able to fight with me and kill me, when we will be, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, you shall be our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Let's go to the Lord here in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity we have to hear your word, your message this evening. Father God, let me decrease that you may increase and that, Father, our hearts would be made ready for this. Let us break the spirit of fear and open into a new dimension of a willingness to fight for the things of you. In Jesus' almighty name and all God's people said, Amen. I want to start with the hopeless situation. You see, what brings about the dark times in our lives. There are so many different factors that we deal with. In this moment, we see Goliath coming out. This man, so tall, just a bit over nine feet tall. His armor was so heavy, his weapons were so heavy that it required multiple trained and very strong military men in order to carry it. And he had a life that was forged in battle from his very youth because Goliath was the smallest of all of his brothers. So he was always picked on. He was always fighting. He was in the giant's land, and he was small. How many people know that the smallest ones oftentimes wind up having to become the strongest fighters because everybody assumes they're weak? And so we see him, but then we get another runt in the litter. We get David, who comes up, standing at a nice, outstanding four feet tall, super skinny, and about as ruddy as ruddy gets. You know, that greasy teenager hair. (laughs) This was a dire situation. Here we have Israel facing off against the Philistines. The Philistines want to destroy them, enslave them, take them away, and we have This little tiny boy, half the size of the giant that he's about to face off with. And all the hope rests upon his shoulders. How many of us can say that we can live our lives like that? How many of us can say that we can stand before that giant the same way that David did? Let me ask you, what circumstances are within your life right now? What words or threats have we allowed to take hold of our soul, take hold of our spirit, to captivate us and to convince us to cower in fear? How many people freaked out over the coronavirus, for example? How many of us cowered within our homes, not willing to go out beyond the walls? How many of us were captivated in fear? And it's not to belittle the people who were there by any stretch of the imagination. But it's to think about it, the threat, the potential of getting this caused every country in the world to close down. Just the potential. Our Goliath was so small that you can't even see it. and It can go through most masks. Isn't that crazy? What about government mandates? Governor Jared Polis, for example, has unlimited authority because of a bill that was passed in 2018, and he can dictate anything and everything that goes on in terms of punishment law in any situation as long as we're in an emergency circumstance. And he is the only one that can make the determination of whether or not we're in an emergency circumstance. So let me ask you, How many of us are afraid of what he may do or the kind of power that came out from that? That's why so many churches aren't open right now. That's why the schools are still reluctant to be open right now. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 11, it says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see, the spirit of oppression and fear in this instant captivates the Israelites. It causes them to succumb to their fear. And how would you respond in that situation but not the same 
How many of us would respond the exact same way? We see this gargantuan thing in front of us, nine feet tall, and how many people know the taller they get, the wider, the broader, the heavier, the bigger they get, because they have to support that height. And I'm going to tell you, according to psychology, we have four ways that we're going to respond to this. And the first one is that we're going to freeze up The second one is that we're going to try to run away. And if we can't run away, we're going to be frightened into a position where all we can do is dwell upon the circumstance. And the last one is we're going to fight. Freeze, flight, fright, or fight. Those are your four options in any given moment like this. And most of the time, we are either going to choose to run away or we're going to freeze. Because the fear has captivated us, and we cannot move any longer. You know, let me ask you, what fears are you allowing to captivate you within your life right now? What fears are you allowing to paralyze your spirit? What fears are you allowing to take hold of you? Is it, is it uncertainty? Am I going to be able to provide for my family? Am I going to be able to create a roof over their heads? Am I going to be able to solve the issues? Am I going to have a job tomorrow? What fears are captivating you right now? What fears are captivating you right now that you have control over? See, we must begin to examine these chains of sin which are going to bind us. And the reason why I'm calling this sin is because they're fear and a reluctance to have faith. And any time we lose faith, we have put ourselves against God, not with him. Doubt is the seed for sin. John Calvin who is known for generating the reformist church and is arguably one of the most aggressive uh, evangelists and pastors, theologians in history, said, since salvation is by faith alone, then not sin but doubt, of which anxiety is the immediate consequence, are the most terrible adversaries of every Christian, even the most faithful. It seems that sometimes even a small thing can cause us to fear. That situation of uncertainty, and it takes hostage of us. It takes away our fighting spirit. It strips us away from everything that we can accomplish. And it allows us to come to this point where we decide to fight or flight. And how often do we choose to give our hands over to the shackles? of the slavery of fear and doubt. Are we going to allow him in these moments to take the victory that was promised to us? Are we going to allow him despite everything that God has done for us, despite every battle that God has given us the victory over, despite the salvation that we received, are we going to allow the enemy to captivate us, or are we ready to take hold of that? In confidence, David said in 1 Samuel 17, verses 34 through 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hands of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. David recognized in that moment that this Philistine was the enemy. This Philistine wanted to destroy us and that we had no hope there. But I am going to step out in faith knowing that this God who created me, this God who led me every step of the way has taken me against fiercer enemies. He has taken me against every single combatant that I could ever face and he said, I will give them to you. And every single time, David defeated the lion. He defeated the bear to protect those sheep that his father entrusted him with. And he was entrusted with so little in that moment. And when he had that chance to take on something big, he was prepared in faith to fight against this Philistine that dared to defy and blaspheme the God that created. And David overcame him. You see, we have to be able to come to a point where we can maintain a focus upon God. 
This is what David knew, that we did not in this moment, that the others didn't. Our confidence and faith in God will be built up when we fix our eyes upon him and solely upon him. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore gird your minds for action. Keep sober in your spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Faith allows us to have the victory over the enemy, no matter what situation we're in, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're dealing with. The most hopeless of situations, there's always a light should we have faith in it. And when we come to this point, we must find our niche. See, when we become a Christian, we find ourselves in a war that we did not ask for. A war we never wanted. But you got saved and you gained a target upon your back. A war against your flesh, against your carnality, against the world, and most terrifyingly, against the beings of the spiritual realm. And against your very own spirit. George Patton said concerning the fighting spirit, the time to take counsel of your fears is before you make an important battle decision. That's the time to listen to every fear you can imagine. When you have collected all the facts and fears and made your decision, turn off all fears and go ahead. You see, he understood in this moment, yes, I must embrace fear. Yes, I must understand fear. I must understand it's a natural human condition. I must understand what it is. But then I must take it into account, and in faith, I must step forward and fight that enemy. I must step forward and not allow him victory. I must step forward and not allow him control. We had a chance for fear and to stay gripped by the things of this world. We had that chance within our lives. We had our chance to live in sin where it was easy, where it was pleasurable, even for just a moment. But how many know that as that destroys you, your faith begins to diminish and fear becomes something that's easier for us to live in. That's why we need this spirit. And so we must be willing to learn how to fight. And there are a couple of tools that we have been given to accomplish this fight. A couple of tools that can set us free. The first is prayer. Prayer is the most powerful weapon that we have because it allows us to see the impossible made possible. Prayer is the thing that we must step out in with. It is our direct way of communicating with God. Consider Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, 2 Kings 19, verse 20, and then I'm going to skip to 35. Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me about uh, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard you, skip to 35. Then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. In this moment, Hezekiah stepped out in faith. He prayed, and 185,000 soldiers bent on destroying Israel died. No explanation other than God. General Patton had a habit of praying before battles for direction and after battles, regardless of whether or not he had victory or defeat. He found awe and inspiration in God at the battlefield. He was humbled at the brilliance of God and attributed his victory over the SS Panzer Tank Division to God, and only God, because he knew that he could not accomplish it based upon his might. He knew that the only way that victory would occur was at the hands of God Almighty himself. The second component we need is faith. Faith, this tool is our foundation for defeating any enemy, for defeating fear itself. 
Without faith, you cannot do anything. You cannot accomplish anything. Your prayers will not be heard as readily because it's by faith that mountains move. It's by faith that we have new opportunities. In Matthew 17, 20, it says this, And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have, have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it shall move, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Jesus is talking to the disciples. David had this faith. That is why he was able to defeat Goliath. That is why he was able to overcome the odds. That is why he was able to stand against the enemy, assured of victory. And it was by faith that he was able to free the Israelites. We must employ these tools offensively as well. Victory is always a matter of the mind. So the question is, is how are you using your faith and how are you using prayer? Are you reacting to everything? Are you always sitting on the defensive side? Are you always allowing the enemy to pound at you over and over and over again? Senator Beth Humanic Martinez, former Senator Beth Humanic Martinez once said to me, she said, we cannot do politics defensively. She, she said, because whoever plays only defense has already lost the battle. It's just how long are they going to prolong the inevitable defeat? Consider George Patton's words. Nobody ever defended anything successfully. There's only attack and attack and attack some more. Thankfully, we have a God that when we decide to come out of our shells, when we decide to come out of defense, when we step out in prayer, faith believing, we have a God who will overcome any enemy that comes against us. We have a God that will set you free from that sickness. We have a God that's going to set you free from poverty. We have a God that's going to take your situation, raise you up. I can testify to this because I was super afraid of my finances two years ago, and now I can stand before you and say, I took out 11% of my debts because God Almighty destroyed that spirit of fear and he gave me the ability through prayer, through fasting, in order to come against the things that I was afraid of, the fear that I would not have provision. And not only did he do that, but he permitted me to give more than I've ever given this last year. And I look forward this year to doing even more than that because of prayer and faith. And because that spirit of fear that was captivating me has been broken in the name of Jesus Christ. And so what is it that you're waiting on? What victory do you need right now? Consider Hezekiah. He, his fear was that 185,000 completely destroyed. Elijah and the fire that he had called down from heaven in his moment of need when he needed to be spared from the military, when he want, needed his life to be saved that came for him. What about David who took out Goliath, cutting his head off with Goliath's own sword? The walls of Jericho, which came tumbling down the Egyptians that held, were held back by the Lord's fire. Gideon and the overwhelming defeat of the Midianites with his 300 men. And you, who can be set free from whatever adversary has come against you this evening. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. It's in Exodus 14, 13. So let me ask you the final question here. Can we trust without fear in all that God will do. And can we step out in prayer and faith, believing in the God that will give you your miracle and that will set you free this evening? And if that's you, I want you to consider these, this 
text again. Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. That is the hope that we have. That is the promise we have. But we have to be willing to embrace it. We have to be willing to accept it. And no longer allow fear to captivate us. With that said, I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed here, nobody looking around in this place.